This is Bible Academy. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and we continue in John chapter 14. Now before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and that we are allowing the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity and privilege and everything you've provided so that we can study your word today. We ask now that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus is giving the what we've called the Upper Room Discourses. Uh, we are in chapter 14 where it has different sections that we have broken up. Let's review by going back and reading over what we've seen in chapter 14 so far. Jesus is getting ready to depart. He wants to offer his disciples comfort, but at the same time he gives us some very important lessons. Keep in mind that he's just talking to his disciples. 14.1 Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you will be also. Now let me just pause for a moment and remind you that in this upper room discourse, or discourses, depending on how you want to divide it, Jesus comes back to several topics. But by, by that I mean he repeats several themes within these next three chapters. One of those themes is Jesus coming and Jesus leaving. Uh, we have that here. Now understand within these three chapters there are three comings that Jesus will talk about. He will talk about the second coming. He'll talk about him coming back after his resurrection. And he'll talk about coming in the presence of the indwelling spirit, which is the uh, promise of the spirit that was to come to his disciples, or we might say believers. And we see that main coming in Acts 2. And sometimes we have to study deeply to figure out which coming Jesus is talking about. That's one of the reasons I mentioned that early. We just saw him talking about coming. Verse 4, And where I am going, you know the way. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How are we able to know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you have known me, you will know my Father also. And from now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak from my own, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Now verse 10 gives us another of the common themes we see in these uh, three chapters, and that is the mutual indwelling of the Father and the Son. Verse 11, Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, but if you do not believe me, believe because of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, 
He who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. Whatever you, referring to the disciples, ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Uh, verse 13 is another common theme, and that is the asking in prayer and having it answered. Verse 14, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. We continue the discourse. Now in these final three sections of chapter 14, Jesus will discuss all three members of the Godhead and a role they will have or the role they have in the New Age. Now when I speak of the word New Age, not of course in the modern terminology, but the New Covenant Age, the Age of the Spirit, because it is starting to come in during the ministry of Jesus. Jesus has just taught that the future believer, that is us, should be doing greater works, um, have a greater prayer life, one where we are in sync with the will of God, serving his pleasure. When he teaches his disciples, he teaches them at one level, but many of those things extend into the future to all believers. That is one of those things. We do greater works. We have a greater prayer life. We have powerful prayers. We have effective prayers. We have the Spirit to enable us. Well, Jesus, again, has taught the connection between love and obedience. That'll come up no less than three times just in this chapter. So with the responsibility of doing greater works and having a greater prayer life, Jesus repeats to his disciples, here we go, the basic requirement. Verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Here it is again. Now, by now you're probably saying you wonder why Jesus says this so many times. So first of all, when something's repeated this often, it's important. And then we see, after he repeats this, or after he says this, he goes to another subject, and it's somewhat connected to your obedience and learning. I say somewhat in the sense that uh, you will see that there's a connection between your obedience, your loving Christ, and what the benefit is that usually that, that follows after this statement is made. I'll notice again the way Jesus says it. If you love me, the option's open to love Jesus. If you choose to love Jesus, the way you show that is keeping his commandments. That's the many things Jesus has taught his disciples, not just the straightforward commandments, but the way of life, the obedient life that Jesus has taught. The real sign of love for God, for Jesus Christ, is our obedience to his commands. Note how close this is to a lesson on prayer that we just saw. Powerful prayer depends upon you living a life of obedience. So what obedience does, it sort of throws an umbrella over the next several uh, teaching lessons that come up. Obedience is necessary through all of this. We see it repeated over and over. If you're going to have effective prayer, you want your prayers answered. There should be an obedient life, loving Christ. Now, what is not mentioned here, at least not real often, is the obvious. Here's the obvious. To love Christ, to keep his commandments, you have to know them. So, it's assuming that you already know the word of God to keep the word of God. That is why the emphasis of this ministry is to teach the word so you can obey. You know what to obey. Now, none of us are perfectly obedient. 
But if we are living the Christian life, we are being obedient for the most part. What I mean by that is, yes, we're all going to sin. We're going to sin occasionally. We might even take a long dive into sin. But we recover, we come back, we live a life of obedience, living a life controlled by the Holy Spirit. I'm describing the believer today. We fulfill these commands that shows our love for Him and our prayers are answered. Some say, with use the phrase, uh, I want to do the will of God. You want to do the will of God, then you live an obedient life. And you will see God work in your life. He'll provide circumstances. Some you don't like, some you'll like. Some you'll see God clearly work in. Others you're wondering why God is letting this happen. But you understand all these things are within his will for you as you live an obedient life. But let's understand here, there's still a condition, and Jesus sets it up here. If there is obedience in your life, you show a love for Christ, and there will be greater works, there will be a greater prayer life, you will sense a real purpose in your life. Not just a purpose, I should say, but an important purpose. You are serving the God of the universe. You are obeying your Lord Jesus. He is guiding you. He is empowering you. And folks, in, in, to put it in a short way, this is the Christian life. Is obedience, loving Christ, following Him. Now, we get introduced to one of the key and most important subjects uh, in the New Testament for the Christian today. And that's the Holy Spirit. It's been briefly mentioned a few times in John uh, in various contexts. But now this is going to get personal because Jesus is going to talk about the Holy Spirit coming to the believer. The first century, when he first spoke this, he was speaking to his disciples. Many of these applications extend on to uh, other believers, to us. But some of them are specific to disciples. I will try to remember uh, to remind you what goes to the disciple directly and then what extends to us, but I think most of that is obvious. <clears throat> Verse 16. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, that he may be with you forever. Now, Jesus, of course, is talking to his disciples. But when the Spirit does come, he is with the believer. He stays with the believer. Let's look at this first phrase. I will ask the Father and he will give you. This is all in the plan. Jesus is working with the Father to execute the Father's plan. It's also in the Father's timing. And that includes Jesus getting to the right hand of the Father in heaven in his session. Once that occurs... The Spirit can be sent, and that will come out again. That's important. Jesus, first of all, has to leave, and then he will be replaced through the Spirit. Notice he says, another advocate. Another is another of the same kind. In other words, the Holy Spirit will have the function that Jesus had regarding the believer in the term of advocacy. The Spirit fulfills the advocate role, as did Jesus. In connection with previous verses, the Holy Spirit also enables us to be obedient and gives us power in prayer. So, under that umbrella of loving Christ and being obedient, we see here the coming of the Spirit. If you want to appreciate the Spirit, you want to utilize the Spirit in your life, and folks, I cannot emphasize this enough. You must understand how the Spirit works in your life. You must utilize His power. You must constantly access Him, and it's not hard to access Him. He indwells you. 
and that too is part of the, the topic today. Let's talk about the word advocate for a moment. If you have uh, many translations, you'll probably find many uh, terms that translates this term parakletos. You'll see helper, helper, excuse me, helper, comforter, counselor, advocate, perhaps some other translations. And the reason there's so many is because there's no single English term that defines this word. Because it has those ideas of counselor, but in the sense of, of uh, a, a lawyer who might counsel you, very serious. We're not talking about, as some, some people say, a camp counselor or you know something like that. Uh, he's a comforter. In a sense, he gives you strength. He helps you through situations. A mediator. He supports you. He's on your side. But he also works with God. And all these terms I just mentioned, counselor, comforter, they have different meanings too. So we kind of have to uh, use a Texas term, is whittle it down to where we can get down to to the, the, the nub of the meaning here. And here's what I want you to understand from the term advocate, and that's why I use it. It's used in the translation to portray the Spirit's important role of supporting our position. This is the use more in the legal sense, like a lawyer. In a sense, he speaks for you, but he doesn't really speak for you. It's as if he speaks for you. So he is your supporter. He's your strengthener as we desire to do the Lord's will. Let me put it this way. The advocate shows, the word advocate shows how the Holy Spirit supports us, our position, when we're doing the Lord's work. He's there to strengthen you. He's there to give you what you need. Uh, Sometimes it's for the moment. Uh, the advocate has another side. Uh, he's used for a defense counsel for Jesus uh, who pleads to the Father on our behalf. So Jesus is our advocate or rather the Yes, Jesus is our advocate when he pleads to the Father on our behalf when we sin. That's in 1 John 2, 1. So that's the other side of the function of the advocate. So understand, he supports us in strengthening our correct position. In particular, when we are doing the Lord's work or speaking his word. Now, another truth we should see here is that it's stated that the Holy Spirit will be sent or given. This was promised earlier in John. Uh, John the Baptist spoke of it. And he will be mentioned to be sent by the Son twice and the Father twice. Let me just write this up here. The Holy Spirit. He's sent. This was promised by John the Baptist. Jesus talks about it, and so does the Father. It was promised that Jesus would send the promised Spirit. And it will be sent by both the Son and the Father. See, this kind of repetition, as I've tried to point out, means that this is important to understand. He is sent to work on your behalf as your advocate, as your supporter. Now, these subjects about the Holy Spirit are going to come up again and again, but this really introduces it because this is the main thing the disciples are going to need once Jesus re uh, departs. 
they're going to need someone to take Jesus' place. And the Holy Spirit is sent to indwell the believer, to provide the believer all that he needs as if Jesus was with him. Now, with that said, let it sink in, I'm assuming that we all need to hear this. Let it sink in that the Holy Spirit is filling in where Jesus left off when he departed. And now you can begin to realize how powerful and how important, how necessary it is that we understand the subject of the Holy Spirit. He is giving you to work on your behalf. So many Christians are struggling with their Christian life because they're trying to do it on their own. They're trying to do it out of their flesh. They're trying to do it out of their own determination. Folks, you must utilize the Holy Spirit. So many reasons why he, does with, he deals with spiritual matters and this is the spiritual side of your life. You need him actively working within your life. So the more you understand about him, how to appropriate his power, his usefulness for you in the sense that he provides what you need to live your Christian life, the better you will live the Christian life. And that comes back to that obedience. You want to be obedient in the Christian life? You want to love Jesus? Utilize the Spirit of God in your life. In verse 17... Jesus goes on to describe the Holy Spirit. He calls him the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him. But you know him, because he abides with you and will be in you. Several important things here about the Holy Spirit in this verse 17. First of all, it's called the Spirit of Truth. As God is truth, so the Holy Spirit is truth. The Holy Spirit had several functions regarding truth, both in the Old Testament times and the New Testament times and in our day. He revealed truth through new revelation. He empowered truth certain people in the Old Testament. Today, he both convinces and convicts us of truth. So there's many good reasons to call him the spirit of truth. He operates in the realm of truth. The next thing we see, whom the world cannot receive. The unbeliever can't accept this. He not only not gets the Holy Spirit, he just can't accept the issues that, or the many facts we learn about the Holy Spirit. It's interesting to keep in mind that the Spirit does come to the world, but the world's not able to receive him. He indwells every believer. But the unbeliever cannot acknowledge him or even recognize him. It says here, because it does not see him or know him. He's not something or someone to be seen, and they can't know him without the empirical evidence the world will not accept his existence. It says also, neither can they know him. Gnosko. A word we should be familiar with. We come across it many times. To have a personal knowledge of. An intimate knowledge of. You know about gnosis and epinosis. Gnosko means you have a personal knowledge of. An experiential knowledge of. The unbeliever cannot have this. The main reason is because he's basically, and just to put it straightforward, he's spiritually dead. The human spirit within the unbeliever 
is not enlivened to connect with God. Now, this is a term I use in my teaching for the concept that when you become a Christian, your human spirit is activated, enlivened is the term I use, so that now you have a connection with God. Now, the unbeliever has no connection with God. His spirit is dead. It's inactive towards God. The spiritually dead person has no personal knowledge of the Holy Spirit. Now, they may have experiences with different types of spirits, evil spirits, uh, uh, an influence that Satan cast over the world. And they may experience all sorts of spiritual things, but the Holy Spirit, comes to those and these know him who are Christians because their spirit has been activated towards God. Now the spirit does have a ministry towards the unbeliever that has to do with conviction of his sin when he is searching or seeking to know God. Well, let's continue. In contrast, our same verse says, but you know him. Present active indicative. Keep on knowing him. The believer does have a personal knowledge of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he abides with you and will be in you. Now, here's where I have to point out he's talking to the disciples. Currently, when Jesus is talking to the disciples, the Holy Spirit is with them. Let's talk about the word abide again. This is a word we need to know now, especially as we get to chapter 15 and see it over and over. It's the word meno. Remember, mene meant dwelling place that we've seen in this chapter. May know is the verb. It re means to remain, to stay, continue, or reside. A mene is a residing place or a dwelling place. Jesus says to his disciples, but you know him because he abides with you. Uh, with you. Uh, let me just show you this preposition, para. It has a dative case here. Uh, it means nearby, beside, or with. So, in what sense was the Holy Spirit actively working with the disciples? Now, the main way that the Holy Spirit actively worked within the spot, the uh, with the disciples was through Jesus. The Spirit was with Jesus, the Spirit operated with Jesus, and as long as Jesus was in their presence, the Spirit worked with them. So the Spirit was in Jesus with the disciples. The disciples many times witnessed the Spirit's power while working with Jesus, by following him. So that is the status of the Spirit and the relationship with the Spirit. He is with them. But then we get this next important phrase, and will be in you. Let me just get that back up on the board so we can see it. And will be in you the very end of our verse. Later, after the resurrection, now this is for the disciples, Jesus will provide the Holy Spirit to the disciples in a special way. In John 20, 22, which we'll eventually get to, Jesus gives the Holy Spirit to his disciples in a special way. 
We've already seen that Jesus has talked about giving the Holy Spirit uh, to those as living water back in 739. And when we get to John 20, 22, we'll look at it there. But the main coming of the Holy Spirit to be in you is in Acts 2, the day of Pentecost. Now let me give you a little pause here to emphasize something. We must never estimate, underestimate the presence of the Spirit in our lives and that experience. What I'm saying is this, that we must believe He is there and works in us in many ways. Folks, if we don't know how He works in us, how are we going to utilize Him? How are we going to be aware of Him? How are we going to realize His significance in our lives? What I'm saying is, we need to believe what we learn about the Holy Spirit. You know, it's like someone might say to you, you're a lot smarter than you think you are. What is that telling you? Well, you have capacities that you're not utilizing. Or you're stronger than you think you are. That's a way of saying you have strengths that you're not utilizing in your life, that you have there. And that's what I'm trying to say about the Holy Spirit. You have to learn these things about the Holy Spirit and believe them to utilize them. The simple process of allowing Him to control you. A basic function of living in the power of the Spirit is letting the Spirit control you so you can live in His power. That's an act of faith. You have to believe it. Now, he's still going to be there whether you believe it or not. But you have to choose to allow him to control. There are two prominent problems in our Christian culture when I say that. And, uh, Christian, The Christian world, the Christian terminology, and that's very broad because it includes an awful lot of people who call themselves Christians, and some are not. Some are very messed up, uh, scripturally, doctrinally. But one of the major problems in the culture with the uh, idea of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer that nullifies his effectiveness, one of the major problems that nullifies his effectiveness in the life of many Christians First of all, is the damage the charismatic movement has done in representing the Holy Spirit in so many ways. Should I say misrepresenting the Holy Spirit in so many ways. Too often, the Spirit is equated with emotion or feelings. It's wrongly assumed that it's something that has to be stirred up uh, like we might stir our emotions up before a big ball game. You know, they have pep rallies and stuff like that before you go into the game and people get in a big circle and they hold hands or the cheerleaders come out and whatever is the case and people get all stirred up in their emotions. That's not the way the Holy Spirit works. But it's common in many charismatic and other church assemblies now. It's certainly spread to mainland denominations, or mainline denominations. <clears throat> to where they have their worship assembly and they get very emotional and stir people up to hear whatever message is coming. Sometimes these uh, singing assemblies go on and on and on and on. And they believe that's the spirit movement beyond them. I don't find that in scripture. But it's done in the auspices of worship. And often throw in counterfeit spiritual gifts like tongues. Now if you're not familiar with that subject and my teaching on it. I have a special on it. 
as well as I've taught it in the, uh, some of the earlier basic series. So first of all, it's the damage the charismatic movement has done, misrepresenting the Holy Spirit in so many ways. The second, and that's what goes on, or should I say, what should go on in the more biblical churches, by that I mean those who teach the Bible more, or more in line with Scripture, and that is that the many ministries of the Spirit needs to be taught. Uh, his indwelling, His enabling, His teaching ministry. How things, the operations, let me put it that way, the operations of the Spirit. What we are to do, His provision of spiritual gifts. How we get to where we can use those. His personal guidance of the believer in conjunction with the Word of God and your knowledge. Uh, we're looking at some of those ministries now. These things are often not taught. It's not a good way to put it, but they're, they're not taught very often in churches. Thoroughly. Now just think of it. Now think of what we've just studied. Let me ask you a question. Who replaced Jesus? Now, I'm using this just to, to get you to think about this. You'd say the Holy Spirit. Now, he didn't really totally replace him. Of course not. But his functions on earth with his disciples, he says, I'm sending you another advocate. Now, don't you think it would be important to learn about as much as you can about that advocate? Understand that one of the main ways we experience our relationship with God, with God the Father and God the Son, Jesus Christ, is through God the Holy Spirit, who indwells each and every believer right now. Let me do this simply. Just, just kind of use this as a surface of the earth. All right? Here you are down here. This is you over here. All right? I'll put several yous down here. <laughs> when Jesus departs to go with the Father, and he's seated up there at the right hand, he doesn't leave you as orphans. He sends you the Holy Spirit. And he has said, he's not on the outside. He's not with you as Jesus was. He is in you. Get it? He's in you. That's significant. He's not going anywhere. He goes where you go. You don't lose him. You need help, he's there. You need guidance, he's there. You need power, he's there. You don't know what you're doing in this situation, he's there. And one of the main advantages of studying him in this context as we have it here, we get a fuller understanding of him as we see Word for word, what Jesus says about him. The whole idea of Jesus saying to his disciples, he was with you and now he will be in you, is real. They saw his being with Jesus in the miracles. They saw what the Spirit could do even with them and power. Luke 9, 1 through 2. Jesus sent his disciples out on sort of a, you might say solo, wasn't quite solo, training mission. And they did miracles. They did the works. And now Jesus is telling his disciples, which is also true of us, 
He will be in you. He will have a dwelling presence in the believer. Now let me say this on a personal note. It may be the case that some of you need to wake up and realize that he's in you right now. He doesn't need to be woke up. He's been ready to work in you since you were saved. Give yourself over to him and allow him to empower you to accomplish those greater things. In verse 18, Jesus continues to speak of the Spirit. He says, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. When he says, I will not abandon you as orphans, the idea is to leave you or send you away so that you're on your own like a child without parents. In the ancient world, it could be said of losing one parent. You were considered an orphan if you lost one parent. Or when the disciples lose their master, they're considered orphans. Now children need parents for many reasons. For support, for guidance, for teaching and training. In other words, Jesus would not leave his disciples as helpless or unprotected without guidance. Notice he says, I will come to you. That's personal. Jesus states clearly that he will come to the disciples. Now he's already said that he's going to send the Spirit. And now he's saying, I'm going to come to you. Now, Jesus is going to talk about his coming. Now remember I said earlier in an introduction to this lesson that there were three comings that come up in these uh, passages and the discourses. This coming, well, we'll identify it in the next verse. Verse 19. After a little while, the world will no longer see me. But you will see me because I live, you will live also. I underlined little while because that's one of our big clues here. Uh, referring to what departure this refers to. Jesus will be leaving to go to the cross. Uh, after his death and his resurrection... Once he goes to the cross and he's buried, the world will no longer see him. But then Jesus says, but you will see me. This refers to Jesus' post-resurrection appearances. After Jesus resurrects, he only appears to some believers. He has a few appearances to different groups of his disciples and then some 500 other believers. Scripture only mentions the disciples and a few hundred other believers that see Jesus after his resurrection. Uh, the few hundred is documented from 1 Corinthians 15:7. He appears to the disciples a few times after he first arises and then for some final instructions. But then he disappears again. There's no record of Jesus making any public appearances in his resurrection body. These private appearances to his disciples were just that, for them to see him. They would see him alive. Which brings us to our next phrase, because I live. They will see him because Jesus again would come back alive in his resurrection body. So this is to show and to encourage his disciples that yes, he's going to leave. But then it says, well, we'll see in a moment that he's going to come back. You will see me, y'all. Yeah, here we are. But you will see me, right in our verse, because I live, I return, and then 
you will live also. Now these are references to their future resurrection also. Uh, it's a little bit, uh, what, what do you say, clouded here in the way it's stated, a little ambiguous. But you will see me because I live, you will live also, referring both to Jesus' resurrection and their future resurrection. Now keep in mind as we speak about these post-resurrection experiences, uh, appearances I should say, that that is one step closer towards his exaltation and then the sending of the Spirit. Let me give you that outline again here. Uh, let me just get a little timeline. Uh, that is not a good one. A timeline. Uh, here's the cross. All right, Jesus is going to depart. He goes to the cross. Then he's buried. And then he's resurrected. He'll walk the earth some 40 days. All right? So if we were to count this out, well, let's wait. Let's get the outline done first. <clears throat> so he'll walk with the disciples several, some <clears throat> several occasions. He'll come and appear to them. That's the promise that we see here. He'll come back. Then he will go to be seated at the right hand of the Father. He will send the Spirit. All right. We'll just put Acts 2 to, to label this. And then he personally will come back later on at the second advent. So, in one sense, he departs here. All right. He comes back post-resurrection. Post-resurrection appearance. Okay. He departs here. He will, in a sense come back with the Spirit to indwell here. But then physically he comes back here. There's the third coming, you might say. So that's the framework we're looking at here. Right now we are looking at he's getting ready to leave. He goes to the cross and then he's post-resurrection right here. Verse 20. I'll keep that up there for a few minutes. In that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. Now this is one of those difficult verses to explain, because which of these numbers, as I have them up on the board, is he referring to? Well, here it is. In that day of the resurrection and the following days. Events have started. When Jesus is resurrected, clearly a new era has begun. Resurrection power has come on the scene in Jesus' resurrection, seen first in his own resurrection. So what this says is, in that day, things are starting to happen. Let's just use red here. In that day, at the resurrection, okay, things have started. Resurrection power has occurred. It will be followed later by the same resurrection power and the power of the Holy Spirit that will enable believers to live the Christian life. So that is one of the things, the activation of the Holy Spirit in the life of believers. Now, he says, in that day you will know. This is experiential knowledge. In other words, you will participate 
as a believer. Knowing that I am in the Father and you in me. Notice, Jesus in the Father and you disciples in me. This is the mutual indwelling that the believer has with the Son. This is the mutual indwelling that the believer has with the Son. But notice how it's presented. Jesus says, I am in the Father, you in me, and I in you. Now, folks, there's all kinds of ways that this, is, that this is, has been presented so far in what we've seen on this topic regarding mutual indwelling. The Father dwells the Son, the Son dwells the Father, the Son dwells the Believer, and that's what we see here. But we're going to end up learning, and I might as well just lay it out for you right now, to make it simple, because this is what it comes down to when you add all of these up, and that is within you, you have the Holy Spirit, you have Jesus Christ, And you have God the Father. When this is all said and done, and we piece all this together, just to let you know, you have the triune, triune God indwelling you. Now this begins to become a reality to the disciples when the Holy Spirit comes. And we're going to see Jesus talk about this. Now we call this subject mutual indwelling because it also talks about the believer indwelling Christ and we'll get to that too so just keep in mind that this is where this is going the Holy Spirit the Father and the Son are all united in an indwelling intimate relationship with the believer and notice how that is put let me put the verse back up there again in that day, when all this is said and done, Jesus is resurrected, the Spirit is sent, you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. Now, if Jesus is in the Father, and you are in him, where would you be also? In the Father, right? Did you follow me there? If Jesus says, I am in my Father, and you in me, where would that put you? Well, if you're in Jesus and he's in the Father, you're in the Father too. So, again, this is mutual indwelling. Now, this is one of those topics that you don't hardly ever hear taught in a church. I think a couple of reasons it's difficult. And a lot of people aren't ready for this. Sure, they understand about the indwelling Holy Spirit, but how often do they hear about the indwelling Father and the indwelling Son? Well, we're working through that topic now. This is the mutual indwelling that the believer has with the Godhead. When the Spirit comes, Jesus with the Father, uh, the Spirit with the Father and the Son are all united in an indwelling, intimate relationship with the believer. Now, the disciples, let's go back to their time. They're hearing these words from Jesus. They don't have the indwelling Holy Spirit. They don't have the indwelling Father or the, or the Son yet. But he's announcing to them that it's coming. And it will be known to them. Experiential knowledge. It will become a reality to them. When the Holy Spirit comes along with the Son and the Father. Now you say this is a lot to take in. Yes, it is. Imagine the disciples, and they didn't have the Holy Spirit yet. But they do have Jesus telling them this. They have Jesus telling them this. When this new era of the Spirit begins, the believer will experience... He will know that Jesus is indwelling the Father. 
For the disciples, this begins at the resurrection. And then the mutual residing of the believer and Christ, mutual residing of the believer and Christ will become most apparent in the coming of the Holy Spirit. This is a spiritual unity we have with Christ, who is one with the Father. Now we'll see more of this in chapter 17, but remember what I told you at the very introduction of these discourses, that Jesus comes back to these topics over and over again, and one of those is this mutual indwelling. And it appears that we learn a little bit more each time we have some questions at this point, well, I answered a bunch of them by jumping ahead and go ahead and going ahead and explain to you this is what this is saying. That this is the triune God indwelling the believer. Well, let's understand the framework here. The Spirit will indwell us. Christ will indwell. The Father will indwell. And there will be a closeness and intimacy a fellowship with believers as never before. Now, how will you know this? Now, listen. How does this fit into your mind? How will this be a reality to you? Remember what we've seen repeated by Jesus? Obedience. When you start to believe the word of God, the spirit of God will so work in your heart and will so work in your mind that you will realize, and by that I mean it will become a reality to you, that the Father and the Son indwell you. They will indwell you for the fellowship that you can have with them. And that begins with allowing the Spirit of God to control you. Well, there's a lot of information here about this topic, and I think we'll just stop here, and we'll continue, uh, probably a short review, and then back to verse 21 next time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word today. It's been a real challenge. We thank you that you have given us these truths and we ask that we will have a deeper understanding of these things in the power of your spirit challenge us with what we've heard today help us begin to understand and develop these ideas and thoughts in our minds so we can appreciate the fellowship that you have given us we ask these things in jesus name amen